All righty. So you want to take a look at the last five of these? Basically, I guess it's 42. Okay. And, and on. All right. So 42 says the salt BX, when dissolved in the water, produces an acid solution. Uh, which of the following could be true? <clears throat> so it produces an acid solution. So I guess it's, it's an acid. Um, which of the following could be true? Ah, all right. Um, let me move that over here. Okay. So we have a salt BX. Uh, when it dissolves in water, it produces an uh, acidic solution. So uh, let's see, BX is a salt. <clears throat> so when you add water, you're gonna get some probably B plus, plus X minus. Uh, so they want, which of the following can be true? Uh, HX uh, is a weak acid. That could be true, right? Because the um, X minus, you could imagine uh, something like uh, CN minus, um, F minus. So it could be, uh, a weak acid. So I would say that's a possibility. Uh, HX uh, is a strong acid. That also could be a possibility because it, it, X minus could be like NO3 um, or CL minus. <clears throat> so I say, yeah, that's possible. The cation B plus is a weak acid. Yeah, that can be um, possible too. It could be uh, NH4 plus, for example. Um, all of the above are true. Uh, yeah, I'd say that one. Yep. All right. Yeah. So, all right. Um, did you want to see any other ones? So, I mean, 43, 44, 45. Okay. Which of the following statements is correct? <clears throat> a solution of ammonium chloride will have a pH uh, less than seven. All right. Ammonium chloride is this compound. And so if I make a solution, and I, I remember my solubility rules from Chem 200, I know that that uh, completely breaks up into these ions. And uh, you should note that Cl minus, which you might think is a, a possible base because it has a negative charge, uh, you, you can see that it isn't because if it acts like a base, a Bronsted base and accepts a proton, then you're gonna form HCl and OH minus, but that's a, one of the seven strongs. So that doesn't happen. Oh yeah, I remember now that's a spectator. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, this guy though, that's possibly an acid. So I can react that with water and it gives up a proton. And I recognize what it forms, it's a weak base. That's ammonia, that's the stereotypical weak base. So this equilibrium will engage <clears throat> and it will produce some ammonia. 
as opposed to this one, which won't happen. It's not going to produce a strong acid, but this will produce a weak base. Um, so yeah, the solution is going to be acidic. So the pH is less than uh, seven. Uh, a solution of potassium bromide will have a pH of seven. Okay, so potassium bromide, again, from solubility <clears throat> chem 200. I know I get potassium plus bromide. I recognize this as one of those very soluble uh, group one metals. Uh, and as far as water is concerned, it doesn't react with water, so it's a spectator. I recognize this uh, just like Cl minus up here as the conjugate base of a strong acid HBr. So again, this guy's a spectator. And um, yeah, I would expect the pH to be seven because this salt, um, although 100% dissociated, it's dissociated into two spectators which won't react with water. And so I would expect the pH to be seven. The next one, a solution of cobalt two chloride will have a pH less than seven. Um, so cobalt two chloride has that um, look to it. Um, and I guess I could look up the solubility of this, but I know even if it's in water and say those chlorides don't completely dissociate from the cobalt, I can see that um, this is one of those Lewis acids that we kind of looked at a little bit uh, in the last chapter. And um, it forms coordinate covalent bonds with water. And we briefly mentioned how these guys can be fairly acidic. Uh, so I think that's a possibility too. Uh, let's go on to the next one. <clears throat> Given the KB of ammonia and the Ka of uh, hydrofluoric acid, a solution of ammonia fluoride will have a pH less than seven. Okay, so ammonium fluoride uh, looks like that. So <clears throat> I have a, um, a mixture of ammonium and fluoride. I recognize this as a weak acid. It's the conjugate acid of ammonia. I recognize this as a weak base. It's the uh, conjugate base of the weak acid, uh, hydrofluoric acid. <clears throat> so in these cases, we had mentioned last time that uh, we can't know the exact pH, but we can compare the Ka of the weak acid to the Kb of the weak base. And whichever one's larger, is going to win the day and carry the, the pH either in the basic um, area above seven or in the acidic area below. It tells me in that problem that the Kb is 10 to the minus fifth, the Ka is 10 to the minus fourth, so the Ka is greater than the Kb, so I, I'd expect the pH to be less than seven. Uh, the last one, a solution of sodium phosphate will have a pH of less than seven. All right, so sodium phosphate 
looks like this. I know from my solubility rules, um, I'm going to get this. And I know that that's one of those metal group one ions that are spectators. They don't react with water. Phosphate is the conjugate base of uh, a weak acid. So I would imagine that this could react with water to form phosphoric acid, or at least in the first step, this. And so I would expect that solution to be greater, the pH here, to be greater than seven. So it looks like that the last choice is the, the right one. Uh, any questions on that? All righty. It says, describe the pH of the following salts. Okay, sodium fluoride, sodium group one metal. Um, I know from the um, solubility rules that all of these guys are 100% um, dissociated in water. Okay, first of all. Now, uh, like I was saying for that first one, sodium is a spectator and uh, F minus is a base. So I'm going to expect that first one to be basic. The next guy made up of ammonium chloride. I have chloride, which is the conjugate base of the strong acid. So it's a spectator. I have ammonium, which is the conjugate acid of the weak base. So it's going to be acidic. The next one, I have potassium iodide. So I have for that one K plus and I minus. K plus is a group one metal, um, not gonna react with water, spectator. Uh, I minus is the conjugate base of a strong acid, uh, hydroiodic. And so again, that's a spectator, so I expect a solution of that salt to be neutral. And the last one, ammonium uh, fluoride, we just did in this previous uh, problem. And we found out up here that the pH is gonna be less than seven because Ka is greater than Kb. So that one's going to be acidic. So basic, acidic, neutral. Neutral. Oh, wait, cannot tell without further information. So it's got to be second to the last. But I we could tell because we did have further information from that previous problem up here. But they didn't give us that information in this problem. So I'll take the second to the last one. Uh, any questions on 44? Not, not for me. Okay, good. And um, 45, <clears throat> which of the following statements is false? HClO3 is a weaker acid than uh, HBr. <clears throat> They're both strong. Um, and I would have to, geez, I'd have to guess that that's false. Um, and the reason why I'm just guessing this is because I have to figure out
the uh, the bond strength and whichever one um, is weaker is the the stronger acid but I can't figure out what the the difference in bond strength is so I go to the next uh, criterion which is uh, partial charge delta. So you have to look at the withdrawing groups. So X in that first case is one Cl and three oxygens, which is pretty electronegative uh, negative compared to the Br, which is also elect, uh, pretty electronegative, but I would uh, go with the um, Please go away. Uh, so I, I would guess that um, that HBr is weaker. So that looks like it might be false to me, that first one. The next one, HClO3 is weaker. Yeah, and it is weaker because uh, it, of what we just said about the delta. Uh, you have more electro, electron withdrawing groups in ClO4. You got an, an extra oxygen. HClO3 is a stronger acid than a weak acid. Yeah, so a strong acid is going to be stronger than a weak acid phosphoric. So that's true. Uh, F minus is a weaker base than Br minus. Uh, that's definitely not true because Br minus is the conjugate um, base of a strong acid, HBr. So I'm going to switch my answer from that first one, which I wasn't very sure about, to that second to the last. F minus is a stronger base than Br minus, which is a spectator. Uh, then the last one, the anion ClO3 minus is a weaker base than the anion H2PO3 minus. And that's true because that's the conjugate base of a, a strong acid. And so that's a spectator. Whereas uh, H2PO3 minus is the conjugate base of a weak acid, H, uh, phosphoric acid, H3PO3. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to switch my answer to the second to the last. How are you sure about that one? What, the F minus is a weaker base than BR minus? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, no, no, you're, you're right. I, I'm confused. Uh, my reasoning was right though. <laughs> F minus is the conjugate base of HF. Oh, you're assuming H on, on both of them. Yeah. Uh, and Br minus is the, the conjugate of HBr. So this is strong. That makes this the weakest. So F minus is not a weaker base. It's a stronger base. So, so oh, and, and the question says, which of the following statements is false? So F minus is not a weaker base than Br minus. F minus is a, a stronger base. So it's still A? No, it's, it's that one. <laughs> oh. Right? It's because it, it's confusing because the question says, which of the following statements is false? F minus is a stronger base, right? So F minus is stronger. than BR minus because BR minus is a spectator. It's really not even considered a base. So F minus is stronger 
because it's the conjugate of a weak, whereas BR minus is the conjugate of strong and therefore is so weak that it's a spectator. Okay. So F minus is a stronger base. It's not a strong base, but it's stronger than BR minus, which is in all intent and purposes, a spectator because it's so weak. Okay, yeah, so you, you got to keep going back to the question and reading in it to see what they're asking. Um, about that one, I was, the way I figured it out, I'm not sure exactly how I ended up with the right answer, but uh, I was looking at the electronegativities just mm -hmm. of fluorine and bromine, and I was comparing them. And I was like, well, which one compared, you know, paired with hydrogen would actually make it, you know, like you were, then I went to what you were doing, but I was trying to, can you use the kind of the idea of electronegativity to a lot in these problems, or is that something I should abandon? Yeah, I, I think in this case, this case is a case of bond strength. So the last time, uh, or yesterday we were talking about how how can you rank the strengths of uh, like HF, remember, um, versus uh, HCl, HI, and they were the bond lengths were getting longer and longer. So this guy was short. This is a weak acid. Acid. Whereas these guys, um, Cl, Br, and I are all strong acids and they, their strength increases as you go down because the bond strength decreases, it's longer. Uh, now, the electronegativity of this series, and this is where uh, your reasoning fails. The electronegativity, I believe, F, right, that's the, the highest. Yeah. So with your um, thinking, you would come up with this as being the strongest acid, HF. And it's not even a strong acid, it's a weak one. Right, that's what I, that's where it broke down for me. Yeah, so you can't. Number one, bond strength. And then number two, you look at the, the delta on hydrogen and then that comes into play. Like these groups here, when you have oxy uh, acids, there's lots of oxygens in here, like ClO2 or three or four and other uh, electron withdrawing groups, like you were saying, the more electron withdrawing groups, the higher the delta, that's when you use electronegativity. So you look at the electronegativity of these guys to predict the relative charge on the leaving hydrogen. And the higher that charge, the greater the acid strength is predicted. Okay, it sounds like in this case, though, um, for the F minus is a weaker, that that was required to kind of assume the conjugate base pairings with the acid to figure that one out, not necessarily bond strength. Yeah, that's true, but, but it also uh, goes hand in hand with that. Okay. Uh, I was just explaining why HF is a weak acid compared to the other ones in the series, which are all strong. Now, okay. and also this ties back to what we were talking about with uh, equilibrium. So you have uh, say HF in water and um, that's in, in the equilibrium with the conjugate base. Okay, so since these guys are both weak, a weak acid and a weak base, there's an equilibrium that's established. Uh, on the other hand, if I have something like 
a strong acid, uh, and I could put Br here, then I could write a similar equation. But now I see that this is a strong acid. There's not a, a real equilibrium per se. This line, this arrow that goes in the back direction is so tiny that you can't see it. In other words, the reaction lies way to the right. Uh, and that speaks to how weak this conjugate base is. It just doesn't have any pushback. It can't push that equilibrium back in that direction like this weak base did. So equilibrium concepts are at play here too. And so you can use that idea uh, in order to deduce that F minus has to be a stronger base than Br minus because it's the conjugate of a weak, whereas Br minus is the conjugate of a strong and therefore is so weak that it's a spectator. Yeah, the, the equilibrium concept helped, helped a lot. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, okay, great. And that's what we're doing here. We're dealing with equilibrium and, and that comes into play. And a lot of the concepts that we talk about, they all should make sense uh, and uh, be consistent with each other. You can't have contradictory concepts. Something's gotta be um, false in that case. So all of these concepts have to back up each other's logic. And so when you think about it, and you think about it in terms of all these different um, viewpoints, you get a more well-rounded picture of what's happening. Okay, any other questions on this, this problem uh, set? Uh, for this question, uh, for the D, uh, I just, my reasoning was like BR is the, uh, the base from the strong acid. So strong acids produce weak base and I use the other one. Weak acids produce a strong base. That was my reasoning. I'm not sure if it was right. Yeah, it's kind of faulty the way um, you said that. I'm going to tell you why. Um, if you have the conjugate of a weak, that doesn't make it strong. The conjugate of a weak is another weak. So what you said was F minus is the conjugate of the weak acid, right? HF, that's true. But that doesn't make, and then you went on and said, and HF is a weak acid, and that's true, but that doesn't make this a strong base. It's not a strong base, it's a weak base. And that's why they are in equilibrium. Now, with the, the conjugate of a strong acid, like Br minus and HBr, this is a, a strong acid, and so the conjugate of a strong acid is even weaker. It's so weak that it's a spectator. So conjugates of strongs are weak. They're so weak that they're spectators. Conjugates of weaks are also weak and that's why they engage in equilibriums. Do you see the, the difference in my um, words and yours? Yeah, I got it. Okay, good. Yeah, it, it's confusing. You really got to think it through and um, be very anal about the words that you say because they have different meanings. So would the reverse be true if it was a 
strong base, a conjugate of a strong base? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. O2 minus. That's a strong base. I'm going to react that with water. And I'm going to get, uh, well, instead of writing 2 OH minus, I'm going to just write OH minus twice. All right. Now, this is a strong base. And in this case, uh, water, according to Bronsted Lowry's definition, is what? Is it an acid or a base in this reaction? Acid? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and that's because it gives up a proton, and that's what acids do. And bases, they accept protons. So, um, this guy here is the conjugate uh, acid of a strong base, and this guy here is the conjugate base of an acid in this case. Uh, so you see the difference between each one of these is one proton, and that's what makes it its conjugate. So in this case, I added a proton, or, or yeah, lost a proton, depending on which way you go, lost H plus. And here, I added an H plus. So they are conjugates. Um, so I kind of um, just wanted to write that out to show you that uh, the conjugate of a strong base uh, gives you, in this case, um, another strong base. So the analogy with bases isn't as clean as with acids. Uh, another example of the strong base uh, conjugate analogy is something like uh, NaOH plus, uh, NaOH. Uh, we know that's a strong base, Na plus, plus OH minus. And so you're tempted to say, uh, all right, let's pretend that this is the conjugate acid of the strong base, and that would be the conjugate base. And I have to have water in here too. But anyway, um, you're thinking, okay, maybe that's a, a, a conjugate acid, but it's, it doesn't differ by um, one proton. So it really doesn't fit the bill for that. Uh, it's more of just a, a spectator because of chem 200 solubility rules. It doesn't react with water. And, and so it's non-reactive. So the conjugates for the strong base analogy um, is a little, it, it, that analogy falls apart a little bit, I think. So I don't know if that answered your question or helped you at all, uh, but that's the way uh, I see it. It did, it did. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a little more, complicated that with weak I mean with acids it's easier to, to pick out their conjugates and say oh well equilibrium uh, applies for that and so the conjugates of a strong acid are going to be spectators because their the their base strength is so tiny that they don't react whereas when we look at uh, our examples of strong bases our examples of strong bases, we usually don't use anything like this. We usually use some group one or two hydroxide. And in that case, it's, it's more solubility. You get some metal cation and hydroxides. And this metal cation, well, it's really not the conjugate 
uh, acid because it, it doesn't fit the definition. It's not uh, one proton different. Uh, so what is it? Well, it's just a spectator because it's non-reactive with water. And I know it's non-reactive because of the Chem 200 solubility rules. Uh, rules. Uh, all right, I hit that button, sorry. <laughs> I knew I was gonna do it. <laughs> uh, any other questions? All right. Awesome. No other questions, then it's time to move on to some new material, uh, the next chapter. And we start off the next chapter with something that's kind of familiar. Uh, we want to look at the common ion effect. And we talked about this uh, briefly and alluded to uh, some of the results of the common ion effect. So here it says, consider ammonia in water. So we recognize ammonia. What is ammonia? What kind of a compound is that? Anybody out there? We face. Yeah, how do you know? Because I memorized it. Yes, good. So ammonia is like the uh, poster child for weak bases. And we said, that if you're looking for weak bases, there's a couple things that you can look for. Do you remember what they were? One is a negative ion. What's the other? Lone pair. Yeah. A nitrogen with a lone pair. Like in ammonia. Why? Because the lone pair, if I have, uh, according to Bronsted, this guy, if it's a weak base, it has to accept a proton. Well, a proton uh, or an H plus, it, it doesn't have any electrons to share. But this guy with the lone pair, he has two. And so when it makes a bond with H plus, to form the conjugate acid, ammonium, uh, it can do it. So you, you have to remember that. So anything like that. So I could put a CH3 here, and that would be methylamine. Um, and then, or I could put another CH3, then it would be dimethylamine or ethyl and so forth. So you can have all these other possible um, uh, compounds that behave just like ammonia. So all you got to do is memorize or remember how ammonia behaves. And then, boom, you have a whole class of possible weak bases. All right, so we know what happens uh, when ammonia is in water. It forms ammonium and some hydroxide. And then this plate says, can you predict any changes in the pH? So this thing comes to equilibrium, right? So what's the pH? What range is it going to be in when that comes to equilibrium? Below or above seven or equal to seven? You got a 33.33% chance of guessing. No takers? <laughs> below? Here's a hint. Is it below? <laughs> no, it's above. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's going to produce hydroxide, right? So the pH is probably going to be greater than seven because that. Oh, I was thinking of pLH. Oh, yeah. See, it's very confusing. Yep. You got all these things going on, and we know they're connected. So uh, pH equals 14 minus pOH. And you're right. It's going to be below 7, which is going to make this greater than 7. Yep. So again, you knew what was going on. You, you just don't have enough practice about being anal with all of these new concepts and definitions and things like that. So, um, you know, just keep up the good work and, and uh, it'll come. All right. Uh, can you predict any changes in the pH if we added this guy? All right. So now, what does this look like? This kind of a um, setup. Here we have a reaction at equilibrium, okay? It's at equilibrium. Now we're gonna add in a salt. So this salt, we know from Chem 200 and solubility, this salt is gonna go one way actually, and it's gonna produce ammonium and chloride, right? It's in water, it's aqueous. I leave out the aqueous because um, it's understood that we mostly deal with uh, uh, solutions in water and water is the solvent. Um, but anyway, this guy here, ammonium, is going to affect this equilibrium up here. Does anybody? know from Le Chatelier's principle, what happens? Let me remind you what Le Chatelier's principle is, and you should go back and remember this and study it. Le Chatelier's principle says, given a reaction at equilibrium, if you put a stress on that equilibrium, the reaction's going to shift to alleviate that stress. So this reaction up here is at equilibrium. It has a certain concentration of all the reactants and all the products. It's at equilibrium, right? The concentrations are not changing. All of a sudden we add in a spectator, has nothing to do with that equilibrium, and this guy, which is involved. So all of a sudden, it's not in equilibrium anymore. What's the stress? Well, the stress is it has too much ammonium, right? There's too much ammonium. Someone just added another source of ammonium. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, which way is it going to shift? Left. Left. Yeah, you got it. Now, in this case, what we call this um, whole idea is uh, we call it the common ion effect. So instead of something coming to equilibrium and then we shift it with the Le Chatelier's principle, imagine instead of it coming to equilibrium, we put in the salt first. Oops, sorry about that. Say we put in this salt first, right? And so ammonium is in place. And then we put in the ammonia. And then that reaction comes to equilibrium. What the common ion effect says is that equilibrium is not going to go as far to the right as it would have in pure water. And that makes sense with the Chatelier's principle, which takes the viewpoint of first you let it come to equilibrium and then you put a stress in it by adding a common ion, it shifts back to the left. What the common ion effect says, well, put in that common ion 
first and it's not going to go as far to the right, but the, you still get the same endpoint. And that endpoint is that the pH is not going to be as high as it would be in pure water because it, the equilibrium doesn't go as far to the right. And you know it's not going to go uh, as far to the right. And you can rationalize why two ways, the Chatelier's principle and what we're talking about now, the common ion effect. So to put it um, in light of LCP theory, the LCP predicts that this reaction, if it's at equilibrium, then you put in the common ion, it shifts back to the left, like you said, and therefore what happens to the pH? It goes down. Yeah. Yep. All right, any questions or comments on that? Okay, so we can run with this common ion effect now. Essentially, it, it's true for anything in equilibrium. Right now, we're looking at um, uh, just acids or bases, right, in water. Uh, but it's, it's also true for salts, um, and it, it's also true for complex ions and other reactions that come to equilibrium. So the common ion effect in general uh, says that that reaction that would come to equilibrium is not going to be as far to the right as it would be in pure water. Uh, in other words, if it was a weak acid, then the pH isn't going to be as low in the presence of a common ion because it's not going to go as far to the right and produce H3O+. If it was a weak base, it's not going to go as far to the right. So the pH um, would go down in that case, like we saw. If it was an insoluble salt, like, um, I don't know, how about uh, lead iodide? Uh, lead iodide. Aqueous. Actually, that would be a solid. And that's in equilibrium with its ions. So when it comes to equilibrium with the ions, with the ions in water, you have a certain concentration of these ions, right? And that's associated with its solubility, how much this dissolves. Now, if I instead, I didn't let it dissolve in pure water, but I let it dissolve in, I don't know, maybe a solution of sodium iodide, which I know is Na plus plus I minus. So I have some ion that's common to this equilibrium, then this solid isn't gonna go as far to the right. In fact, it's gonna shift back to the left because it's in the presence of a common ion and its solubility is gonna decrease. So, these are all examples of, of what's called the common ion effect. Uh, any questions on that? So we're gonna dwell on this idea a little bit and uh, take a look, look at some examples. And also this concept, the Le Chatelier's principle, the common ion effect, it all also goes hand in hand with the Q and K concept, okay? For example, um, if we look at this weak acid, this acetic acid equilibrium right here, uh, we know that we're going to get a certain concentration of H plus and C2H3O2 minus, the acetate uh, anion. Now, 
if I add in a common ion, like this salt, which gives me a spectator, Na plus, so I don't really care about that. I could ignore it. And the acetate anion. So now I have more acetate in this equilibrium. Le Chatelier's principle says stress, the stress is too much acetate, got to shift back to the left to reach a new equilibrium. And then um, those concentrations will be different, but the ratio of the concentration of the products over the reactants will be the same. So it reestablishes the equilibrium constant. I can say, well, I can, I can say, well, geez, I can use the Q and the K concept. Remember Q. Q is the reaction quotient. And it's defined the same way as the equilibrium constant, the concentration of the products to their stoichiometric coefficients over the concentration of the reactants to their stoichiometric coefficients. So now in the presence of this common ion, this guy here is too big. So that means Q is going to be bigger than K. And we know that when Q is bigger than K, the reaction has to shift back to the left to reduce the amount of products, increase the, the amount of um, reactants until Q equals K and equilibrium is reestablished. So all of these concepts go hand in hand and you can use them to, to rationalize this common ion effect. All righty. And so what, what uh, we have here in the next few plates is just some examples of common ion problems. And it introduces, uh, let's see, well, the percent ionization, we've, we've already uh, looked at that equation, so it didn't introduce that. But anyway, this is how an ice table would change in a common ion problem. You, you can see it right away. In that initial um, row, we don't have zero in this spot. And the reason why we don't have zero is because we're not letting this weak acid come to equilibrium in pure water. We are having it come to equilibrium in a solution of a strong acid. So these common ion effects will have like uh, these other things added into it, but these other things will be 100% uh, dissociated. So there'll be examples will be um, salts that completely dissociate. And you know those salts from your basic uh, solubility rules in, from Chem 200. So again, if, if you don't remember those basic ones about the group one and the two metals, about ammonium and, and so forth, then go back and look at them. We know, or we should recognize that this guy is a strong acid and we, we don't have any of this 0.1 molar nitric in there, the nitric acid. We got 0.1 molar H plus and 0.1 molar NO3 minus. NO3 minus is the conjugate base of the strong acid. So it's a spectator and we can ignore that. And it's not involved unless it's involved in the equilibrium, then we'll have to use it. But it's not involved in this but the H plus is, and that gives us some initial source of H plus. But we can play the same old uh, ice table game and just include it in there, then relate the equilibrium constant to how it's defined using the law of mass action. Then we can plug in the form using our algebraic parameters, X, and that equilibrium row. We can also invoke the 5% rule. This time we're adding an X here and subtracting it here. Uh, and check that to make sure that it's less than 5%. Now, we only have to check once. And, and this is the critical one because if it's less than 5% of 0 0.05, it's certainly gonna be less than 5% of 0.1. So, we can check that after we calculate the X 
and see that in fact it is less than 5%. So by ignoring that X, we don't lose uh, any uh, accuracy on our value. And so this goes through a, a possible common ion problem that you might see. And just for fun, uh, we have a percent ionization of uh, 0.18%. How would it change if we dissociated in pure water? In other words, this up here was zero instead. It would go from 0.18% dissociation to uh, to 6%. So you see it's a lot greater. And that it goes hand in hand with Le Chatelier's principle, which says that if you um, dissociate in the presence of a common ion instead, then it's not going to go as far to the right. And therefore, X should be smaller when you have a common ion. And it is. In this case, X is bigger because it's in pure water. So I got an X of 0 0.003 in this case when it's in pure water uh, versus nine times 10 to the minus fifth when it's in the presence of a common ion, namely 0.1 molar nitric acid. So the common ion effect is, is not that much uh, more than you already know. It's not mind blowing or anything. And it goes hand in hand with the Q concept and uh, Le Chatelier's principle. Any comments or questions on that? All righty, now we're gonna go <laughs> with look, now we're gonna talk about buffers and it looks like, oh my God, we just went from talking about the common ion effect to buffers, I, what's going on? Well, it turns out that buffers, it, they're examples of common ion effects. And so it, it leads right into buffers. And you wouldn't know it until you studied what buffers are, uh, how you make them, and how they work, and stuff like that. So it seems like it's disconnected, but it's not. So we start off with, you know, buffers. Buffers are very important um, because, as you know, uh, buffers help maintain a certain pH, and that could be important for reactions industrially or in biological organisms or wherever. So sometimes reactions work better when they take place around a certain pH. So if you're running a reaction in lab and you wanna um, maximize the, the yield, then you might want to uh, put in a buffer to make sure that the pH stays around a range that's conducive for your reaction. Uh, you also know that buffers are very important in the human body or any biological system. Buffers are important in swimming pools, in your fish tank, and so forth. So what do buffers do? Well, it says right here, they resist changes in pH. And you could look at, you could probably go online and look at a lot of examples of videos of how buffers work. But this picture here uh, on this plate um, should serve uh, that purpose. Uh, if you look on the left, it says, I'm gonna add a strong acid, nitric acid into water and see what the change in the pH is. It turns out that the pH went down, obviously it has to go down because it's a, an acid it went down by 4.49 units. Now, you take the same um, amount of strong acid and then you add it into the same volume, but this time it has a buffer in there. It has this HFF minus buffer. And you see that the pH again goes down, but it only goes down by 0.3. And, and that's important. You know, if you're trying to grow some beasties in an auger uh, situation, they could kill themselves in their own waste. But if you put in a buffer, 
they have a better chance and they, they could last longer because the pH isn't going to change as much. Um, somehow that base that they're exuding in their waste is going to be absorbed. So now we see uh, pretty much what a buffer does, but what is a buffer made of? So we want to find out, you know, what buffers are made of and then how they work. And then eventually we're going to get to how to make up buffers. So when you're in biology lab or wherever, and you're working in industry and, and your advisor or your boss says, uh, I, we're going to need a buffer for this system, you're going to know how to do it. You're going to know what it's made of and how much to put in of all its components. All right, so the next plate tells us what buffers are made of. Um, and it's great because this is the topic that we're looking at. Buffers are made up of weak acids and their conjugate base. Or a buffer can be made up of a weak base and its conjugate acid. So buffers are just what we're talking about. Right? We've been talking about these weak acids and weak bases and how they're in equilibrium. That's what buffers are made of. Isn't that um, fortuitous? Uh, all right. Now, this next plate tells us or indicates uh, how a buffer could work to, to maintain that pH. Now, check this out. It says a buffer is made up of a weak acid. And here I have some generic weak acid, HX. It could be um, H acetate for acetic acid. It could be HF for hydrofluoric and so forth. And so this would be the F minus in that case, that's the conjugate base. And they're in equilibrium, all right? So we have this equilibrium established in your uh, fish tank, your swimming pool in your body or whatever. Now, how can this maintain help maintain pH? Well, when that beast starts making waste or you get acid rained on, it's going to be absorbed because in this buffer, you have a source of an acid and a source of a base. So if the beast is producing um, a base, you can imagine that it could react with the acid in your buffer and make water in a salt. So it gets absorbed. And the same thing over here. If it gets acid rained on, it's outside and it's going in your pool and you, and you get some acid in there, then that acid can react with the base in your buffer and form water and salt and be absorbed. So now we know what buffers are made up of and how they work, right? But how do they keep that pH from changing very much? You know, that's a, an important question that we're going to need to understand. So right now we're just kind of looking at it and now we're going to start digging in a, a little deeper to understand what's going on. And as always, if you have any questions about any little thing, just holler. So I'm just going to keep marching up and down the square. <laughs> it's, a, it's an old Monty Python reference. You wouldn't understand that one. Uh, all right. So I, I, I stuck in this plate. We talked about this one yesterday. But it's important. And it's important as to how buffers absorb the acid or the base that's introduced into their, their system, right? So you have a buffer which is made up of a weak acid and its conjugate base, and they're in equilibrium. So in this example, we have acetic acid and the conjugate base acetate. So over here, I have acetic acid. And here is a strong base that's introduced into the system. Over here, I have the conjugate base. And now I have a strong acid that's introduced into the system. 
Now you should know if you looked at that video and studied it from our discussion yesterday, that these reactions are of the type of a completion reaction. Whenever I have a strong acid or strong base and it reacts with another acid or base and they could be strong or weak, in this case, they're both weak. The reaction is a completion reaction to form uh, the water and the salt, okay? So there's a strong driving force for uh, forming water. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. Uh, and we rationalized their uh, equilibrium constants would be really huge. And it's not surprising uh, because of the KW for water. Strong driving force for making water. And, and I put this plate in here because this is the first step of the action of a buffer. A buffer absorbs an acid or a base, right? So we need to know to what extent that reaction is gonna take place uh, because we're gonna later on have to quantify what's left and what the new pH is. So the first thing we have to realize is that the reaction of an acid and a base takes place to completion when one of those are strong. Uh, any questions on that? So this is kind of a review of what we, we were talking about yesterday. All right. Now, I want to be able to recalculate pHs after the absorption of acid and bases into a buffer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the equilibrium expression to help me keep track of how concentrations of H plus, for example, in a buffer system would change. So in this buffer system, uh, I have some weak acid uh, HX, and this is an equilibrium with its conjugate base. Okay, so it has an equilibrium constant and that equilibrium constant looks like this, All right? Concentration of the products over the reactants. Now, I wanna keep track of pH. And so I know pH is minus the log of H plus. So really I wanna see how the concentration of H plus is gonna change to see how pH is gonna change. So I take this equilibrium expression and I solve for the H plus in that equilibrium expression, right? Just bring the other stuff to the other side, flip it around and I have um, how H plus is gonna change. So H plus equals the equilibrium constant plus the ratio of the concentration of the weak uh, acid over the concentration of its conjugate base. And in the previous slide, we said, well, a buffer works because if I added um, a strong base, then that's going to be absorbed. Or if I add um, an acid, strong acid, then that's going to be absorbed. And, and that was back here when uh, we were talking about how a buffer works to absorb any excess acid or base. Okay. All righty. Now, if I add a strong base, What am I going to produce? Anybody know in this reaction here? I have a, a weak acid and a strong base. What am I going to make?
Water? Yeah. What else in this case? Would it be just an ion? Yeah. Or... X minus, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a conjugate base. And this is the definition of acids and bases and how they work. An acid gives up a proton, a base accepts it. Bronsted Lowry definition. Now, to what extent will this reaction take place? Is it an equilibrium? Obviously, yes. in, uh, well, no, obviously it's not because of what we just said back here. <laughs> You haven't had time to, to study this. <laughs> so um, when you add that hydroxide, the strong base to the weak acid, remember it goes to completion. It's huge, strong driving force. Same thing down here. So there's our, our buffer. So these are completion reactions. Water, conjugate base. In this case, if we added in a, an acid over here into the buffer, what am I going to make? Again, if this is H3O plus, I'm going to make water and what? HX. Yeah. And again, this is a completion reaction, no equilibrium. We showed the huge equilibrium constants, big values, strong driving force for making water. So if I'm gonna change, if I'm gonna find the, the um, changes in the concentration of H plus because a buffer is working, then if it absorbs hydroxide, what should happen to the concentration of HX? in this reaction, what should happen to this concentration of HX? It's probably too, it's too easy of a question. It goes down, right? It's, it's reacting, this is going to completion. So this concentration here decreases, okay? What happens to the X minus concentration? Increase? Yeah, and this increases. So this ratio should change and the pH should change. And when we have a buffer, it does, but it doesn't change very much. Um, and I'm trying to get at that. Why doesn't it change a lot more? And look at the, the same thing if it, if it absorbs an acid. If it absorbs an acid, in this case, this concentration decreases and this concentration increases. So according to my math, buffers should not work. Does anybody see a way out of this um, seemingly contradiction? If you do, then... Uh, you shouldn't be taking this class. <laughs> no, go ahead. You can take a guess. Maybe you do know. How can I get out of that contradiction? If one increases and, one, and the other decreases, this ratio should change, and so should the pH. And so a buffer shouldn't work according to these, this math that I'm doing but it does and we know it does. Does anybody see the, the trick here? A water way, is doing something? It, it's, it's, maybe it's even simpler to that than that, okay? So we know that the H plus concentration is proportional to this ratio, 
of the weak over the conjugate uh, base, both weak, right? It's proportional to that ratio. Now, what do we have to do in order to make sure that that ratio doesn't change? We know that it looks like it's changing and it will. For example, uh, let's say I have a ratio of two molar over two molar, right? And it absorbs something. So uh, one will go up and the other one goes down. And so two over two is one, that doesn't equal three. That's a big change, right? But check this out. What if instead of making it two over two, I made it say 2000 over 2000. And then one goes up and one goes down. Hey, that's pretty much, um, that's pretty much one. That's the secret of a buffer. You just load up your buffer system with a lot of weak acid. You load it up with a lot of conjugate base. So when one goes up and the other one goes down, the ratio is pretty much the same. And so it remains constant. Yeah, the pH does change in a buffer. And we saw that in that first example, it changed a little bit. But if you put in a lot of this and a lot of this, then that's going to dampen the effect. What's a lot? A lot is um, a, a lot more than what you expect its change to be upon absorption of excess acid or base that's introduced into the buffer. So uh, again, what's a lot? Um, so th this just explains what we just said. This kind of gives you a visual of what is a lot. A lot is this. That's the amount of weak acid and conjugate base compared to the change. It's a lot compared to the change. Like two over two, the change was went up to three and one. That's 100%. This kind of percent is going to be, this kind of percent change is going to be a lot smaller. And so now you know um, how a buffer works to maintain the pH. Uh, and, it's, and it's indicating or hinting towards how to make up a buffer. Yeah, I know I can make up a buffer of an acid and, and its conjugate base, but if I take hydrofluoric acid and I throw it in water, I know that this equilibrium is going to come about. And I know that that fits the definition of a buffer because I have a weak acid in equilibrium with its conjugate base, but this is weak. That's less than 5% ionized. It's mostly whatever that concentration is, if it's one molar, it's pretty close to one molar HF and very little F minus. That's a terrible buffer. That's not going to work. I have to add in some more of F minus. In other words, I got to do a common ion effect kind of deal. I have to add in some maybe sodium fluoride to give me a, a, a larger source of F minus, the conjugate base. So buffers are an example of this common ion effect uh, that we were looking at before. So a lot of this stuff is related. I know it looks kind of unrelated, but it's not. And I'm just trying to help you see the forest from the trees and then we get into the trees and then we got to come back and make those relationships uh, in the forest again. But this is, I think, a good spot to, to stop our discussion until next week. And then we'll go over this again because you know we're using a lot of concepts that you just learned and you're you're not that 
um, I think, confident yet using it. So try to work out as many of those homework problems as you can. Try to look at um, ones that you don't know, go through the notes and understand um, you know, as, as much of this stuff as you can. So I am going to, to stop there. I'm gonna wait in case anyone has any questions. Uh, otherwise, have a good weekend. Thanks, Professor. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. I just had a, a question.